Okay, so let's continue with descriptive statistics. Uh, again, descriptive statistics are um, used to describe data, um, but does not provide meaning. So we have three measures of central tendency in descriptive statistics. Uh, hopefully you're already familiar with, with these. Uh, the mode being the most frequently occurring score, the median being the middle score, and the mean being the ar arithmetic mean. So here's an example. Uh, in this case, Professor Wilson wants to test his students' memory. So he gives them all a simple digit span forwards test. Uh, he, need, he reads a list of numbers to each student and has them repeat the numbers back to him. So he might say uh, 319, and then the student repeats back 319. If the student gets them all right, he presents another sequence of random numbers. Uh, this time the sequence is one digit longer, so this time he might say 5283 and the student repeats them back. He records the highest number of digits the student repeats correctly. Okay, here are the results of Professor Wilson's study. So the first thing we should do is order the results and show the frequency of scores. Uh, we could do a little histogram here if we wanted a visual representation, but once we have them ordered, uh, now we can begin to show mode, median, and mean. Uh, so clearly the, the mode here would be five, we have seven occurrences of the number five. Uh, the median would be seven, and we know that we know that we have 20 scores. Uh, N equals 20 here. Um, and we know we have 20 scores, so for the median we can count off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And from the other direction, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's important to note that when we have an even number of scores and we're looking for the median, we take the average of the two results, and obviously in this case, the average of seven plus seven is seven. Uh, so our median here is seven. To find the mean, the arithmetic mean, we add up all the numbers in the sequence and divide by the numbers in the sequence. And you are probably perfectly capable of doing that on your own. And I happen to know here that the mean is 6.75 is our mean. So our question here is, what happens if we have an outlier? An outlier is a score that is clearly different from the rest of the data. Uh, in this case, we suddenly get one student who is able to repeat back to the professor up to 18 random numbers before making a mistake. So what does this outlier do to our scores? Well, the mode is still 5. We still have more 5s than any other numbers. And our median is still 7. Now we have 21 numbers, and our middle number is still 7. So the mode and the median have stayed the same. But the mean, when we calculate all the scores together, we sum them and take the average. In this case, we get a mean of 7.28. So of the three measures of central tendency, the mean is always the measure that is most affected by outliers. <clears throat> measures of variation then indicate how much spread or variability there is within a distribution of scores. Our three measures of variation are range, variance, and standard deviation. And hopefully you've had at le or you've at least heard of these before. Um, the range is the difference between the highest and the lowest score. So let's say in a given classroom, what is the difference between the tallest and the shortest student? The variance is the measure of how different each score is from the other scores. And the standard deviation tells us, on average, how different are the scores from each other. Or in this case, what is the average difference in height for every student in the class? It's the average, not the actual difference. So if you use our previous example of digit span forwards, the range in the first case is 4. Right? 9 minus 5 is 4. The range when we include the outlier is 13. 18 minus 5 is 13. So measures of variation, the range is most affected by outliers. Variance is how far a set of numbers is spread out from the mean. It's calculated by the sum of the deviations squared divided by the number of scores. So in this case, we have to first calculate the deviation of each score. This is the distance of the score from the mean. And we're going to leave out the outlier to do this. So I'm going to show you how to do this using um, Excel. OK, so what I've done here is I've just gone ahead and I've entered in all of the scores in one column for Excel. And then here I've entered in our mean of 6.75. And what we want to do now is find the difference between those. And that's a simple function in Excel. We just hit equals, 
by the first score minus the mean gives us negative 0.175. But of course what we want to do here to calculate variance is not just the difference but the difference squared. So what we really want is that result multiplied by itself. That's probably the easiest way to go ahead and set that up in Excel. And then we can copy that. We can fill in the rest of our column. And now we get the difference for each of the scores. To find the variance then what we have to do is we have to take the sum of all of those divided by the number of scores, which in our case was 20. And we get a variance of 2.285. That is our population variance in this case is 2.285. In order to calculate standard deviation, which again is the average difference of the scores, we do exactly the same thing, but we take the square root of the result. So for our population deviation, and again I'm going to go back to Excel, So to find the standard deviation, we just have to take our variance, which was 2.2875, and find the square root. So in Excel, we equals square root of that score, and we get 1.51245, and that is the standard deviation or the average difference between scores in the set. Now for both of these, what we have here is the population variance and the population standard deviation. It's important to note that in some cases, what you want is your sample variance and your sample standard deviation. And that is the deviation within your sample group in the experiment. In that case, it's exactly the same procedure, but we actually divide the result by n minus 1, so in this case, 19 and then we get a variance of 2.40789 and a slightly different standard uh, deviation. And that's just an important thing to keep in mind if you're reading about stand, um, sample deviations versus population deviations. So what does all this mean? Well, if we graph out our scores on a bell curve, we can show where the, sco the scores fall within each standard deviation. So here we have an example of what we call a normal bell curve. This is a special situation in which the mean, the mode, and the median are all equal. And therefore the scores are equal, although not the scores are equally, although not evenly distributed either side of the mean. A typical example example of a normal bell curve is IQ scores. So the standard deviation for IQ is fifteen. What this means is that the average difference between people on IQ scores is fifteen points. And the mean is 100, meaning the arithmetic average of all scores is 100. In this case, because IQ scores happen to work out to be a normal bell curve, what we end up with is about 68% of the population fall within one standard deviation from the mean, either way. Another 13, an additional 13% are two standard deviations above, and 13% are two standard deviations below. Yes. Typically, normal bell curves are not the norm. Uh, more commonly, you're going to get data that is skewed to one degree or another. And here's a pretty extreme case in which an outlier at the low end of the scale has created a negative skew. So you may read about or you'll see um, data in the, that asks questions about negative skew or positive skew. The skew is always named for where the outlier occurs. So because our outlier here occurs at the low end, we call this a negative skew. Similarly, we can get an outlier, um, in this case, that is caused um, that has caused a positive skew. So again, because our outlier is up here at the high end, in this case we have a positive skew. Okay, so let's move on to correlations, which we covered briefly in the last lecture, um, but here we'll go over it in slightly more detail. And as I think I mentioned before, there are three types of relationships, positive, no relationship, or negative relationship. This is commonly represented on a scatter plot, which I hope you've seen before and possibly graphed on one, in one of your math classes. 
correlation coefficients are always expressed as negative to positive 1. Here's an example of a positive correlation. Uh, as one score goes up, so does the other. So in this case, Professor Aljahani is interested in comparing his students' scores on their unit paper with their scores on the unit exam. And he discovers there's a strong positive correlation between the two. Um, so he may say that, okay, if a student scored low on the paper, it's highly likely they're going to score low on the exam. Um, this might suggest to the professor that the system he used to grade the papers is an accurate predictor of how well the student will do on the test. Here, a coach is interested in the relationship between his cross-country team's mile run times and their GPAs. So according to this particular scatter plot, um, there is no relationship. And we can see this because, for one thing, the, the points on the chart are scattered. But really what we're looking at here is a very, or an R value, a correlation co coefficient, that is very close to zero. So any correlation coefficient that is that close to zero is going to indicate that there is no relationship between the two. Finally, the principal wants to know if there is a relationship between discipline infractions and GPA. And according to this chart, there clearly is. As the detention hours go up, GPA goes down. And again, we have to be careful about causation in all of these cases. Does the high detention hours cause low GPA or vice versa? If we make the causation correlation error, the principal might be tempted to simply not assign detention and assume that grades will improve. We have to also be careful about validity and reliability. In the first example, the professor can only know that the paper, is a, the paper grade predicts the exam score. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good indicator of the student's understanding of the topic. Perhaps neither the exam nor the paper assesses the information that was taught in class. We also do not know how reliable the scores are since this is a single occurrence. If we want to determine reliability, the professor would have to give the same or very similar test multiple times to see how similar or dissimilar the results are. If the scores vary considerably from one occasion to the next, then there's little reliability in the results. Okay, so all of this is descriptive statistics because it describes the data, but we cannot derive meaning yet. For that, we need actual inferential statistics.